Bibles, go ahead and open up the book of Luke. Thank you, jazz band. Hallelujah. I was having much fun watching Sam. Jumping around back there on the drums. Amen. In Luke chapter 2, verse 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. Because there was no room. Father, we love you. We thank you on this Christmas day, Lord God. And we lift up your name. Because your word is true. That if we have lifted up the name of Christ, all men will be drawn unto you. And God, we thank you for this day where we recognize that you were born. You left heaven as a missionary and you came to earth because you had a plan. We thank you that we are part of your plan. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I often remind us about the story of, of Joseph going to the end. Because that's like the, the fulcrum of Jesus' uh, birth. That week before he birth, she gave birth, in fact. and A young girl, teenager, some say as young as maybe 14, having to drive and go around on a donkey. You know, and I'd never been pregnant, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. However, I can only imagine, and I've seen, you know, my wife, I've seen her struggle through her pregnancies. And ladies, you can relate to this much more than any of us men can. But on that week before you're giving birth, you're not quite a happy camper. Can I say that? Everything's uncomfortable. Nothing fits. You, you forgot how your toes look. And you're just miserable. And here she is, very young, riding a donkey. Think about that. She wasn't riding the Cadillac, going to the hospital. She was on the donkey. The last week of her pregnancy in pain. But she was under orders. She received orders from an angel and what she was going to do, and she did it. And she, all this took place during the worst of times. You know, when we look at Christmas now, we see the trees and the, the flowers and the lights. And if you go to our house, it looks like a winter wonderland. We have decorations. And, and that's good. But the fact is, the, the first Christmas was a terrible time. The rulers in place, Emperor Tiberius, the stepson of Augustus Caesar, was an evil man. In fact, he was out to get Christians. We'll find out later in history, they write, that they were killing Christians. Pilate, he was in charge, and he was, he was known and renowned for cheating his Roman bosses. But not only that, he was taking advantage of the Jewish citizen, the Judean subject. He would rob them, cheat. So both these men were despised and feared. So the people were not happy. We can say this for a fact. That during the first Christmas, no one was happy. Compound that with the little girl, 14-year-old, having a baby on a donkey. And then, then they're riding into another region where this man by the name of Herod, Herod, who was insanely paranoid, had it ordered three of his sons and one of his my wives to be executed because he thought that they were plotting against him and she rides into his neighborhood. It was the worst of times. So you had these terrible three, and, and then you, you would think, well, uh, she had some hope if she came to the church, but the church was run by the religious leader by the name of Annas, and he was the high priest, and he was no godly man. In fact, history shows that he was a flunky of the Roman authorities. So he couldn't even, she couldn't even run to the church. He sold out his morals, any kind of faith he may have had for his position. Christmas began at the worst possible time. 
I, I imagine Christmas today, some of you probably had a, maybe a little difficult time. Don't raise your hand. But I know some probably even today just barely made it to church today. Been struggling throughout the week. Oftentimes because the picture is everybody should be happy and merry and you're not feeling too good, you might even think something's wrong with you. I'm here to tell you everything's right with you. See, because we don't go by our feelings and we cannot go by our surroundings as the first Christian describes. If God were looking at the surroundings, he would say, Jesus, I think we picked the wrong day. You can't get born right now because it's a terrible time. You don't want to go to that brother's house. They're fighting. You don't want to go with that sister. She's crazy. You don't want to do that. I mean, if we went by that, there'd be a lot of people we wouldn't want to talk to today. Hello, someone. No, on that first Christmas night, God gave us the first Christmas night during a terrible time, but he gave us a gift. He brought the gift of Jesus. Jesus, the light that shines in darkness. Uh, Jesus shines in the darkness of our lives. Like I said earlier, I don't know, maybe you have never done anything wrong, but I needed Jesus to shine in my dark life, my dark, cruel merciless life. G well, John 1, 4 says, The Word was a source of life, and this life brought light to mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness shall never put it out. So the, the gift of Jesus, but it also began with the gift of Mary and Joseph, because it was here's two, a couple who were not married, and I've always, I talked about this, you know, poor Joseph. Because Mary was Patrol to Joseph, but for one year he could not touch her. And so they had to walk in obedience. So God spoke the first story. Mary tells Joseph, well, an angel came to me. I'm not really pregnant by, uh, you know, man touch me. Now, it sounds good in, in, in storytelling, right? But think about this, dude. If I were Joseph, sorry, Deborah. Let's imagine the first couple was Albert and Deborah. And, and Deborah came to me one day and said, and, you know, we were engaged to be married. And I had not touched her because for the first year you can't touch her. And then she comes to me and says, I'm pregnant. Hmm. And I know I didn't touch her. You're pregnant, huh? Yeah, I'm pregnant. But nobody touched me. Oh, okay. Now you think I'm real stupid. I'm thinking, then, I, oh, but, but, well, God made me pregnant. Now, how many of us right now, fellas, would believe that if your girl came to you and told you that? You'd tell, well, you better tell, you better kick rocks, because God's got to take care of that thing, right? You would tell her to kick rocks. Hello, someone. Come on, don't act like, no, I'd be holy. You, you're lying. On, you can't be lying on Christmas Eve. If your girl came to you and said she was pregnant by God, and no man touched her, and she was having somebody else's baby, what would you do? Joseph believed God. God told him, and he had to believe it. So the gift that was really present in this miserable time was two people who believed God. Because if they had not believed, first Mary, if Mary had not believed, she could become pregnant and said, do to me what you will. And then the angel proceeded to do what she, he, he was intending to do. All she had to do was say, hey, no way. Because God would not superimpose his will upon anybody. So Mary had to say, yes. She obeyed, she believed, she said yes, she allowed God to do the plan, she moved, and then Mary had to believe she was pregnant by, by God. He had to believe, and he said, I believe. The gift on Christmas was obedience. They were obedient to God's word. See, these are the gifts that are more important to God. Not, not anything you can do, but do we have the gift of obedience? So we talk about the gift of Jesus. God gave his son well, what are we going to give? The shepherds came and they seen what was happening and they worshiped and they were in awe of everything that took place. Imagine the picture. All this was taking place and while Mary and Joseph were doing these things, the shepherds are in the field and they see a star in the sky. Then the angels came and began to sing. Now, I don't know about you. If the angels came to me right now, listen, let's be honest. If the angels came to me right now in the, in the dark of the sky and they started singing and telling me that Christ was born, and I was a shepherd in the field, I would first think, I'm having a flashback. 
Right? They were in awe. And they believed. Right? The faith that was present on that first day. And those first days when it was the worst of times. It was a terrible time. They believed and the shepherds gave worship. Why? Over a baby. The gift of baby Jesus. Now, we always read that Jesus created the heavens and the earth, right? It's, in fact, it said that Jesus holds it all together. All powerful. Almighty. Right? The power. He, he, had the, he, he endued Moses with power and he split the Red Sea. The power of baby Jesus. So I think about that. I go, wow, the power of baby Jesus. Then I see baby Jesus. Now, I'm kind of weird like this. But somebody had to clean baby Jesus' poo-poo. That trips me out. I'm kind of weird like that. I know you don't think like that. I'm going to help you out. He was a baby. Right? And what all babies do is eat, sleep, and poo-poo. I go, wow. And then we have to take a step forward. Imagine Mary and Joseph. They had all these things going on. Now they have to believe somehow that this little baby who they had to feed and change his diapers was God. Faith. In the worst of times, when sin much abounds, the Bible always says that faith much more abounds. The great faith it took to believe that this little baby was the savior of the world. Would you believe it? Some people have a hard time believing it now. That's why they keep backsliding. The faith that was present, they believed it. See, in the worst of times, that's where faith is greatest. So did you go any through changes? Did you have a hard time making it here? See, if you did and you're going through troubles and tribulation and you're here this morning, that tells me that faith was arising in your life. Despite the turmoil, despite your failure, despite the misery, despite the corruption, despite whatever's happening, you're here. Whether you recognize or not, that's faith. That's faith. Why else would you be here if you didn't believe? Now, you're, you, you may think you're hanging on, but it took great faith to overcome the terrible times. Anybody have any terrible times? And then we have the picture of the wise men. You always see the three wise men, which is a misnomer. There was, there was not three wise men. There was probably several dozen. There was a caravan of wise men that history even describes that led, left the land of the Chaldean, which is modern-day Iraq. And in that area, that's where mathematics and science and astrology was very high. And the people in that, in that area were very wise. In fact, even till recently, the, math, the greatest ma mathematicians came from that part of the country, or the world, rather. And they've seen this thing in the star because they studied the stars, and they knew something great was happening, and they used their science. Science drove them to Bethlehem. Now, we would drive from here to Denver. We think it's a big deal. But they traveled by camel for months and months because science, even science said something is happening here and they came so what they did bring, they brought gifts they brought excellence they brought the gift of excellence so they, they talked about the three wise men, the reason why they say three wise men is because there was three distinct gifts given, but there was a caravan there was a troop of wise men that came from there and they gave what are these scientists, these wise men, these noble men, men of high regard, high esteem, what did they give to Jesus when they seen this little baby who was perhaps in their manger crying? They walk into this place where Jesus was born, and Jesus wasn't born at, at, at Memorial Hospital or Penrose, the fifth, one of the top 50 hospitals in the country. No, he was not born there. He was born where? In a manger. Doesn't a manger sound nice? But let's, let's cut the to the cheese right here. It was a barn. It was a manger. Get manger. Sounds like, oh, the manger. No, it was a barn. And he was, he was born out of a trough. That is where animals will eat. So sloppy, 
cows and pigs and sheep were eating in there. You ever smell a barn? If, if you want to know what a barn smells like, well, I was going to say something, but I won't say that. Almost, almost ever. It's Christmas Eve. Well, I can tell you right now, a barn don't smell good. So here are the wise men who travel miles and miles and miles by camel, right? And they show up for this great spectacle, and they end up where? In a barn. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in the wise men, that'd be like a letdown. No, you think you're traveling across. Oh, let's go to a great palace. We're, we're going across, and we're going to see this great, this great thing. No, they went to a barn where cows and goats and donkeys use the bathroom. And they walk in there amongst all that manure. Just like they walk amongst the manure of this world. They walked in and they've seen this baby who's going to save the world, not in a palace, but in a stinking barn. Now, did that stop them? Some might say, well, forget this. I ain't giving this dude nothing. He's in a barn. <laughs> we'll give him a barn. What are you talking about? I think we made a wrong turn at Albuquerque. We're in the wrong place. No. They proceeded to go by faith. Once again, because without faith, it's, it is impossible to please God. They proceeded to go by faith, and they brought out their best. Huh? They brought out gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the most valuable product of its day. There's nothing more valuable. It would like be like somebody giving me 10 Bitcoin right now. Basa, masa. You know what I mean? You guys know what Bitcoin is? Very valuable. But anyway, let me move on. They got their most precious commodity, and they gave it to Jesus. See, when I look at that, I go, wow, you see the faith. And then I always wonder during this time when I see this, why do people have a hard time with tithing? It amazes me. Faith. Listen, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In the most terrible times, Mary operated in faith. Joseph believed God. The shepherds worship in awe. The wise men come and give their best to a baby. Think about that. Now, you know how American, you know, we go, oh, I'm not going to give, you know. And we have all these excuses. I'm not going to give because, you know, I don't, I don't like that church. And, and you know how the church is. And, and those people, and they hurt my feelings. And, and then we have all these things that excuse us from doing the right thing. See, despite the terrible times, despite the fact that you may have just walked into a place that's full of manure, I tell people, what, what's my theme for coming year? No perfect people allowed. I could have said we're full of manure, but that's kind of cold-blooded, you know what I mean? <laughs> no perfect people allowed. Why? Because people will, will come in and see half of you and say, I ain't giving that church, they're all messed up. Well, yeah, we are. Huh? But don't let the manger distract you from God. Don't let the barn distract you. Don't let the smell distract you. You need to do the right thing. Period. Stop using excuses. You might walk into a place that just don't suit your fancy. It isn't up to your par. That still doesn't excuse us from not doing the right thing. Amen? See, the sacrifice of Christmas Joseph and Mary, not only did they move out of faith, but they made some great sacrifices. And I'm coming in from land, I promise. Joseph and Mary sacrificed their reputation. Now, let's not let's look about them. Let's, you know, we know what they did by obedience. But what, could you imagine the neighborhood talking about them? Their friends, their relatives, you know, Mary the whore. Well, she must be Mary the whore. We call the verb. She must be, that must be Mary the whore. Why? Because she got pregnant and she wasn't even married. That little tramp. Could you imagine the talk? See, we don't look at it that way, but that's how I look at it. That little tramp Mary 
And Joseph, that pervert, went and had sex and had a baby. And now they're trying to cover it up with this lame brain story that an angel talked to him at night. He must have been smoking too much camel dung. Something happened to him. An angel came and talked to him at night. And then Mary said she got pregnant because something, a light, sh- when has a light any, ever got anybody pregnant? Right? So you have, you have all the neighborhood talking about them. Because people are people, right? Nothing's changed. People are still, like they talk about you. People talk about me. I tell them, get in line. They talk about you. So I, if it's, nothing's changed, I know they were talking about them. But Mary and Joseph didn't care about their reputation. All they cared about is being obedient to God's call in their life. That's all they cared about. So they had to sacrifice their reputation. In fact, they, they sacrificed their family. They, even their family didn't want nothing to do with them. Oh, you blew. You, you done brought a bad name on my family, Mary. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Huh? The wise men, like, right? Wise men. See, only two out of about 100 people will ever reach their goal. Do you know that? I'm listening on something. Because everybody has gold. But on average, over the over world, only two out of 100 ever reach their goal. That's a pretty hard statistic, huh? Why? Well, one reason is because 23% of people don't know what they want. So already a quarter of the people are lost because they don't know what they want. Right? Two things that made the Magi wise is they knew what they were going for. And they knew how to get it. They said, I'm going here. That's what made them wise. It wasn't the math. They knew there's something here that God is doing, and I'm going to get it. There's something new that's never happened in the history of mankind, and we're going to see it. There's something new taking place. I don't completely understand it, but when we get there, we're going to give it our all. We're not going to half-step. You know, because they never, we're not going to come to church and half-step, be half-baked, faking fraud and a full-time broad. No, no, we're going all the way. Huh? See, they knew what they were going for, and they knew how to get it. That's what made them wise. See, some, some people misconstrue things. They come to church and think that they can just come to church every now and then and think God's going to bless them. The devil's got you fooled. If you don't come all the way, you're not going to get what you, God intended for you. If you're going to just play church every now and then when, when you're mad at your honey or you got fired and you need God in your life all of a sudden... That ain't going to work. That ain't going to get you nothing. In fact, I believe that when you do that, the devil will give you back your job. Just to keep you off your, off your square. Huh? See, when you come to God, you got to come all the way. Not halfway. Don't fake it. You're, you're hurting yourself. You're doing yourself an injustice. You'll become a flake. Snowflake. The sacrifice of Joseph, he believed God. Huh? See, he went to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Hmm? He knew what he was going for. He knew how he was going to get it, but Joseph had, had to make a heavy sacrifice to do it. Like I described earlier, and I'll put it in one word, Joseph had to sacrifice his manhood. Yeah, he did. And so that, that gets a lot of us, you know, especially from my, you know, my, my background, our culture, Hispanics. I know where it's punk. That kind of mentality will make you miss God's calling. It will. That, that, that's just pride. Imagine Joseph saying, I ain't no punk. I ain't going to have people think that my girl went out and had uh, sex with another guy, and then I just let him do it. No, I got to at least kill somebody so I can act like this guy did it. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what I'm saying? Some of you know what I'm saying. Right? Why? But he had to say, no. I, he had to willingly sacrifice his manhood. Ouch! I think about that. I go, man, God, I'd probably, that right there probably would have done me in. Good thing I wasn't Joseph. 
Because God had to rip out a lot of pride out of my life. My pride would have sent me to hell. And I learned along the way that it's the pride that kills most men. I can do not just men. It's the pride that kills most people. So on Jesus, on rather on Christmas time, I want to make a, a suggestion that we come to the Lord and we give Jesus our pride. My pastor used to teach me all the time that only God can handle it. Only God can handle all the glory. Right? That's why we give him the glory. He goes, we give God all the glory. All the glory. Why? Because if we get the glory, we think we're something. Right? Remember, we're the only animal that you can pat on the back and the head gets bigger? So we can't handle the glory. So that's why we have to always give God the glory. Because once you think you've done something, once you think you're something, you're out. That's where the enemy gets you. Because basically, you're just a dirt ball like the rest of us. Hmm? Yes. Before Joseph's encounter with Mary, a 14-year-old girl, he had to sacrifice his manhood. And then Mary, at the same time, had to sacrifice her reputation. Why am I saying this as I'm coming for landing? Because these things that I've discussed right now will determine if you have room for Jesus. So on Christmas, the story says there was no room. Mary was pregnant. Joseph was, was there. And they did all the sacrifices. The, the faith was moving. The wise men were coming. Nonetheless, in the middle of these terrible times, there's always a place. There's no room for Jesus. So that's really the big question that I have for you. Will you be like the innkeeper? When Jesus says, I have a plan for you, will you sacrifice your desires for his? When Jesus says, I have a call for you, will will you put away your call for his? And if you say yes, okay, then your reputation may be attacked. Your manhood may be addressed. You may have to walk into a room full of manure, otherwise known as victory outreach. Can I say that? I just did. You know what I'm saying. You might have to walk in there and receive your call. See, the the reason the innkeeper didn't make room for Jesus is because that person did not recognize him. She didn't recognize God in the midst of everything. All she seen was a 14-year-old whore who had sex with, out of marriage and a weak man who was with her. That's all the inn seen. That's all the innkeeper saw, right? Let's boil it down. That's why I love our ministry. Because when people look at you and see someone who may not amount to nothing, I see Jesus. I don't care what the world may, how they may have put you and how you may have been lost and and thought they were going to rent you off. You've been running amok. No, no. You may have done all those things, but you know what? It doesn't matter. I see Jesus. I see Jesus in you, brother. I see Jesus. I don't care what you did, Andy. I see Jesus in you. That's what Christmas is all about. I don't know who this young lady is, but God is going to save your life. God is going to change you. Because I see Jesus. That's what Christmas is about. Is there room for Jesus in you? What do you see when you see people? Do you see them messed up? Then you're not looking at the right place. You're, you're getting distracted. But, but, but you're getting distracted by the barn. You're getting overshadowed by the terrible times that we're living in. You're infected by the perversion of this world. Something's happened. If you don't see Jesus and the people that are in this church, then you're not looking with the right eyes. Because that's what this Christmas is about. Do you have room for Jesus in your heart? And when I say Jesus, I'm not talking about the Jesus at the right hand of the Father. You can't, you know, he, he don't need your room. The Jesus that needs your room is sitting next to you. 
The Jesus that needs your love, you may have just talked about a few hours ago. The Jesus that I'm talking about is the one who's going to make the altar call. The Jesus that I'm talking about, do you have room for Jesus this Christmas? I want every head bowed and every eye closed. In this day and era, Jesus is often hard to recognize. Why can't we recognize him at least during Christmas? Despite the fact that we're caught up by so many things. Procrastination. Preoccupation. Well, I'm here to kill that. Let's do not procrastinate our complete surrender to God today. Let's do it now. Let's do not preoccupy ourselves with everything else but Jesus. Let's say we want to occupy our lives completely with God's will for our life. If that's you, as we sing this chorus song, and you want to open up your heart, and rededicate perhaps your life. Maybe you made a mistake. And you need forgiveness. Today, on Christmas Eve, is your day. The altar's are